one of those, the land in which we meet the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and their leaders past, present and emerging always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Now, um, the question about recession is interesting is when a recession is recognised and when it isn't, because depending on where you sit in the economy, I think you might feel like you're already in one. That's right. Mm. <laughs> so the, the measures are, uh, I'd say, tricky, really, for the average person as to ha what happens. So in Australia, we've had recessions, we've lived through them, we have recessions and you know, the shrinking of the GT GDP um, that just avoids technical recessions, you know. You can escape by 0.1 of a percent as to whether you're in a technical recession or not. That's an interesting technique. So we had 1990, we had um, December 2008, the GFC, we had September 2016, and in the December 2000, that was where we missed having our technical recession by 0.1%. Oh, sorry, not, yeah, 0 0.1, sorry. So it's a bit of a clear numbers game as to what happens and when, but the, the, I guess the important element is what responses we get. So currently we've got threats facing the economy. We've got the impact of the fires on our local economies and that's significant in the regional areas. We've got the coronavirus impact on both import and exports and um, companies such as Cochlear. Now Cochlear is in fact setting up a factory in China at the, under pressure from the Chinese government, but it's also a huge market for them. So this has led to a, a drop in their stock value and their projected earnings and there's quite a number of other companies that find themselves in the same position in manufacturing. With the offshoring, that means that a whole lot of companies over here who offshore their manufacturing are waiting for the parts to make an assembly. It's also the um, clothing trade. It's also other, um, you know, other parts of the economy. The um, other issues for us are low wage growth, job insecurity and economic disadvantage, where I think in Australia it's the 10% versus the 90% on who's got the most money. And again, what your lifestyle means for you, how you look at it. When Labor was in power in 1990-2009, you got a Keynesian stimulus with the um, conservatives you get austerity. And we've seen that played out with the GFC impact, particularly in the UK, where the wage levels in the UK haven't recovered to the, the levels they were in 2008. So the wages are actually lower. They're only just coming back to the same levels in the UK. And that, they've had the full-on austerity policies of the governments over there. Here we, um, here we have the, the Labor government, so you get the, the Keynesian approach, you get the stimulus. For unions, the colour of the government affects the attitude of employers as to what you can and can't negotiate, how hard they will come at you, particularly in difficult times. Um, their willingness to work with unions on sensible solutions uh, changes extraordinarily when you get a conservative government. They, they actually they do become cruel in the, the treatment of employees and what the situations are. When, when we negotiated during 2009 in our manufacturing industry, we negotiated shorter working weeks, we negotiated use of annual leave, and there was stand down. You know, provisions were exercised. That's where workers get stood down with that paper, don't lose their job because of circumstances outside of the control of employers. Which, um, you know, happened that time. It wasn't, wasn't a, been going very long here. The stimulus package has helped. So also did the stimulus that the Chinese government um, went ahead with, which resulted in us selling a whole lot more iron ore and uh, related products. So we didn't have a huge impact. People didn't notice a recession. They knew it was happening somewhere, but nobody felt too damaged by it. So the, the stimulus package that the Rudd government brought in has never received much credit for 
digging us out of a hole. It, uh, I'm always surprised that Labor never ran hard on the fact they saved the economy. And you have that myth of them being bad economic managers when they aren't. They know it was free, but they're not bad. The, um, you know, then we had the $900 cash payments. Woo! But, you know, some people pop in, but a lot of people spend, so that was the important bit. On your road. Yeah, the school hall buildings. Remember the carry on about the school halls? I actually went into one of those uh, a year or so after that happened, and I was really impressed with the, the structure and the quality of what the school got. Yeah. And it was a benefit to the local community because everybody was using it. Mm. And yet they were damned for doing it. The um, insulation program, there were problems that, with the suppliers or the installers, it wasn't the actual product that was the problem. They, they failed to have certified people and got beaten to death nearly over it. There was public housing construction and that again leads directly to money. Get all this puts money directly into the economy. What we've got happening now is we've got our central banks and we've got employers complaining that nobody's spending money. It's a lack of um, spending and slowing down the economy. That's what we're saying. We're not spending our money, the economy is slowing. We've got the central banks saying the unions should go hard on pay rises. I don't think they've looked at the bargaining rules to understand um, how hard you can go and how slow it is. The um, employers are demanding government financial support. They started immediately with the without great fire experience and uh, they're in the, I don't know whether in the paper today or yesterday, the AIG, already putting the demand on government money for the effects of the coronavirus. So they've already got their hands out. So um, uh, another interesting thing, there was, a, there was a full page ad in the Herald by Pratt Industries boasting that they, through their lobbying, had opened the Australian superannuation purses to local business, which isn't true. But they, and there was, there's another super meeting coming up, or it just happened last week, and they were saying, we did well that time, we're going to do it again. Now, when you look at things like that, it raises questions. Because if we've got a strategy to stimulate the economy, it's whose money are they using, and what demands can we put there? If it's government money, it's our money. If it's superannuation, it's our money. And you, you know, private industries, not the friendly supplier. You know, so how do we, how do we use influence? What do we do about it? There's an opportunity for us. So how do we hold them to the, to the outcomes that we want, which would be decent, decent um, conditions for workers, and that the the profits or the, the, uh, the benefits stay here. There's no offshoring of profits. How do we do that with both government and super money? So we need to look at that. So what are our demands and how do we get heard? So I, the demands that they uh, frequently raised are increase the unemployment benefit and pensions because this directly flows into the economy. We've got, the, we've got business demanding that for the last four months, let alone everybody else, the unions and, um, and the, the not-for-profits. Uh, social groups demanding that. We've, there's investment in new industry and transformative technology. The, the German um, manufacturing is, is an example of that. 3D printing. They export the printers. They don't offshore the manufacturer of it. They, they design, produce and export. What do we do? Um, we import. offshore and import. Uh, lithium is a good example of a mineral. We, off, we you know, that makes the batteries, the long life batteries. One of the universities has just developed a chemical technology that reduces the uh, explosive effect of lithium batteries. They're a bit unstable. What's happened with that? The, uh, one of the licenses has been bought by a Japanese company that we export the lithium to and we buy back the batteries. Shame! The WA government's only just put a um, a levy on the lithium ex exports to try and build a lithium manufacturing industry here. We, there's opportunity that should have happened years ago. Yeah. So there's um, 
We need to increase taxation return for big business and the oil, gas and mining industries. They get a free ride and they put their hand out for more. We need investment in transformative technologies. Coal mining is going to disappear. What do we do for the local communities that need to keep jobs? You're not going to get, you know, coal miners aren't anti-alternative technologies, but they've got their communities and their families, they've got, they've got to be able to live. You can't just go in and say, close it down. So what's happening around that? Yeah. And support for the transformative technology that could go into those areas. Sovereign Wealth Fund. Norway's got a Sovereign Wealth Fund. Singapore's got a Sovereign Wealth Fund. In Singapore, the Sovereign Wealth Fund can be used and is used for uh, re-education. As a worker, you've got an entitlement to money from the fund to learn new skills. And if you're an older worker, you're entitled to um, additional funds. We don't do that here. What do we do with it? We cut the taxes of big business. We didn't have a fund when we got it. We need to revive TAFE. There's further attacks going on TAFE. There's going to be privatisation by lie. We need to rebuild TAFE. TAFE is incredibly important. It's where you get your skills. Yeah. Labour hire needs to be controlled with more than a star rating as to whether the labour hire firms are seen as good employers. Because the problem with labour hire is that it's insecure work and it's used against permanent workers to keep wages down and, and put the fear of God on the people as to, to how they organise. So what we need is uh, they need to be held accountable. In Europe and the UK there are agency worker regulations. We need something similar and but stronger that controls the use of labour hire. So it is genuinely only casual work. Short periods not used against permanent workers. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to make a significant difference. We need to increase the public housing stock. And that will also assist with the price of housing, the rental market and so on. It's a, a crime demand and the, the action of the federal government has been to outsource it to, to community groups who are expected to take um, pushes for them to take loans in the form of bonds or where you know, they're, they're pushing, they're looking at the UK model where we buy bonds, that goes to local community housing to build housing. So it's a, a walk away from government obligations. We ought to follow the New Zealanders and introduce well-being as a budget measure. They did it last year. We should look at that seriously. Budgets can't be about whether you've got a surplus or a deficit. It's got to be about the effect on our citizens and the quality of life of our citizens. So we really need to look at the, yeah. the well-being measure. When government supports industry, it has to be measurable outcomes that are a public benefit, not just free money, because it's treated as free money at the moment. Give us a line and we'll do what we do. It's not even a line usually, it's a, it ends up as a ground. It's come up in the last week, but we do need a fast rail link on the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be properly built and constructed and so that the opportunities go into regional towns, that they are linked to a fast rail network because that opens industry to regional towns because you can move your product quickly. And that's what you need in the marketplace. So we need genuine fast rail links. And when you've got regional towns that are relying on mining, you can replace it if you can transport goods. And that includes food manufacturing. Food manufacturing and export is a growing industry. The export market is the growing middle class in Southeast Asia, not just China. So that needs to be looked at and supported. And it's, it's going to take a, a proper campaign to do it. Uh, we need to review and amend the free trade agreements. We can try abolishing them, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we need to remove the restrictions upon our sovereign governments and remove the power that the current free trade agreements give to corporations. That's got to go. But again, it takes a lot of lobbying. A lot of lobbying happened last year with the, uh, the Labor Party. They changed their policy and they went, went to about the parliament and ignored their own policy. They got to be held accountable. So, uh,
Yeah. So it, it, we, you know, we 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 hit them hard, and it was my union that led the charge. And uh, then they reneged on their own policy. It's like they weren't even paying attention. So then we look at the how, and it's the basic stuff about organise, educate, campaign hard. Um, AMW had a motto which is organise, educate, and control. Because if you organise and educate people, they can control their lives. And, you know, we need to remember that. We need to work with progressive organisations and groups on specific campaigns which means a limited number of campaigns at any one time, the priority targets for the collaborative network to the campaigns. So it's not just unions, not just community groups, it's where the overlap is and plan it properly. So we have to have detailed plans with specific staged actions and goals. It's, it's no good saying we're going to do this without the map on how we do it. So it's the, not just the talk, it's the walk. It doesn't happen without planning. We have to um, educate our union members to get them active. We're within um, AMW, we're starting again to really educate our members. That's fallen into a hole for a whole, for a lot of unions. So people don't get political education. If you're getting your information from commercial TV and if you haven't read really paid the Telegraph, not get much information. <laughs> right? You're getting opinions to sway you but you're not getting any information. Burdock is toxic. We need to learn and adapt as we campaign. There are examples of effective campaigns. The CHG campaign, Lock the Gates, has been a very effective campaign, which has the, uh, you know, the exploiters having to argue on the, on the terms of the campaign. And they've effectively engaged local communities and groups. The school's campaign for climate is another good example. It's a, it's a small group, but very effective, and they've engaged the community in that campaign, and they're very smart, and they're very adept at picking up information and running with it. We had an example, we spoke to them about their list of claims. We said, you've got a problem here. You've got nothing about um, moving to... to uh, new technology and what the impact is work of workers. It sounds like you're just going to abolish a whole lot of jobs up at home and it's not going to be received well. And overnight, they adapted their policy. They listen and they work and they want to work and reach out to those groups. So that, that's an example. We need to see where our allies are. One of the most unlikely allies that you hear about is the Country Women's Association. They are very good on a whole lot of policies. If there's groups like that, we work out ways of working with them. The, um, you know, we're all members of super funds, so a lot of us are members of super funds, but we're not active as shareholders. So how, what do we do with our industry super funds so that instead of seeing the bland reports and the, you know, the chief executive wanting to have a quiet chat with a few people over lunch to tell us how well they're doing, how do we become active as shareholders about where they invest? and what our expectations are, so that our monies are used ethically and within, with our long-term interests. Because it's a lot of money, there's billions in those funds. But we're, we're passive shareholders. And you know, it probably suits the people around these funds. But how do we get active? You don't need a lot of people to get active. <coughs> We need to train our people in lobbying because you can't forget the the um, political element. You know, the, the, there's a saying about the decisions that we make at the bargaining table or the achieve at the bargaining table, they can wipe out in the parliament, they do. So we have to hold local members of government accountable. That means not union officials, it means rank and file members and local communities getting active, but they can't be active if they don't know quite what to do You've got to build it, you've got to train to campaign to get that political influence. They've got to be prepared to knock on the door of a local member and union members are waiting to be asked. So we have to give them the skills and support them to do that because that's a pressure point. We need to build social power that sustains change campaigns. 
So we're very good at running and doing campaigns at times, and then the whole thing collapses in a heap when we lose a whole lot of networks. Now, we, we did that with your, your rights at work, a whole lot of community activists created, and then government changed, and then nothing followed through. We lost a whole lot of activists because they weren't given <coughs> anything to do. They wanted to be active, they weren't asked to be active. We've, um, you know, we've got networks that we established in the Change the Rules campaign, and we need to keep them active because they are our change makers. And it can't be command and control. You have to trust the, the um, local community groups but there can be central coordination about what the objective is. It's how they get there, on we don't get sued, it's fine. So milestones and common goals. And we have to be clear on our messaging versus activism. It's the whole other, you know, you see petitions all over the place, activism and all the rest of it. We, we've got to really knock it down on activism versus messaging. You know, we want to take the message out there to get people active, but we have to understand what our end game is, and that's activism for change. And it's doable. It's tiring, but it's doable. Mm. Okay. Hey. Thank you very much, Robin.